My name is Aram. Are we doing this again? Welcome to Answer Every Question. So here's a question. What are you doing? We are really excited about the first half of Kill Every Monster, season one, and we want to hear what you have to say about it. Do you want to know how we pick monsters for the show, or do you have any suggestions for creatures on future episodes? Do you wish we had asked our guests one more thing? Send us an email at killeverymonster at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at KEM Podcast. You can also fill out a submission form and upload an audio question so we can edit your voice into the show. You can find that link at killeverymonster.com. My name is Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the co-creator and useful host of Kill Every Monster. My name is Alex. My pronouns are he, him. I am from Canada, and now I'm living in China. Welcome to To Kill Kill Every Every Monster. This week, despite my constant objections, we're dealing with flumps. The Monster Manual describes flumps as creatures who mysteriously drift through the Underdark, propelled through the air by jets whose sound give them their name. A flump glows faintly, reflecting its mood and its color. Soft pink means it's amused. Deep blue is sadness. Green expresses curiosity and crimson is anger. Flumps are intelligent and wise, communicate telepathically. Though they resemble jellyfish, flumps are sentient beings of great intelligence and wisdom, possessing advanced knowledge of religion, philosophy, mathematics, and countless other subjects. After a relentless campaign of harassment, my usual co-host is our guest for this week. Ram Vardian is a producer, writer, and daily pain in my ass. When he's not over-editing God's Fall, he can be found lying to make it sound like he knows what he's doing on Kill Every Monster. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm so pleased about this episode, Dylan. I know you are. Thank you for letting me do this. If it weren't for the fact that you edit things I say regularly, I would not have let you. Well, but what can you do? You can't stop me. And I'll cut all this out. They won't even know that I threatened you. (laughs) What I can do is try to blow through this episode quickly because flumps are a garbage creature. (laughs) Aram, you know what the first question is. You wrote it. What is a flump for those blissfully unaware? At its core... A flump is an underdog. I hate this already. A flump is the spirit. A flump is the kind, wondrous spirit that lives in the heart Shut of every up. child. A flump is a little dream given tentacles and fart transportation. A flump is a gift that despite the fact that it hasn't been in a single adventure, except for like a dragon magazine, It's lived through every single iteration of Dungeons and Dragons. A flump is a special, wonderful light that should live on in everyone's heart because it's so absurd. And that's what a flump is. Okay, sure, fine, whatever. That's stupid. But to answer your question better, it's a floating yeah. jellyfish with seven hit points. I mean, that's, a, that's a great way to, to, to describe an aberration. For a lot of people, I know Alex and I both showed up on scene at 3.5, and there's a whole host of folks that came in at 5th edition. And the flump, as you mentioned, was just a weird thing that continued to not die. It's been around since 1st edition. It's always been there. It's never really been in the monster manual. Until 5th edition, which was kind of a surprise. Yes, yes it was. (laughs) I think it's the best part of Dungeons & Dragons. I think it is a creature you're not supposed to kill. Ludicrous and kind of a cartoon, but also fun and good-natured and really only there to help anything that comes across its path. Okay, but you're flipping back onto what you did the first time around. What I need you to do (laughs) is outline... For a listener who, like, is a player and has not flipped through the monster manual and stopped on a page after Flame Skull and gone, what the shit is this? I need you to tell our listeners what 
a flump is. A flump is a small aberrational outsider. It is a creature that resembles a jellyfish with big stalked eyes on top of it that hovers. Well, doesn't necessarily hover. It moves by basically farting. It farts itself around. Yeah, it is fart movements, but it also like doesn't like you would think it had like a normal hover ability and then the farts would just push it. But no, it's like constantly farting just to just to stay aloft, apparently. What an awful creature. It is very intelligent. It's very wise. It is uh, a base intelligence and wisdom of 14, which is much higher than any humanoid race. It is a incredibly smart, floating, telepathic jellyfish. The bit that I feel like is getting left out is these creatures are specifically lawful good. They have effectively no combat abilities. They have a stench spray, which is basically just like a cartoon acme defense. They're not just good, they're afraid of evil. They're afraid of evil, but then if you like jump down a couple sentences, um, they can be found lurking near communities of mind flayers, abolis, Scipionki, and, and, and Githzerai. So like they like hang, they're, they're afraid of evil and they like hanging around evil as well. It's like a rabbit that's specifically really into lions. Look, I'm terrified of heights, but I love a roller coaster, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just want to taste the fear. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna skip this one forward a little bit be, so we can deal with a problem that I know we're gonna disagree on. Aram is a flump a monster. Is a flump so different from humanity that it, of course, by looking upon it, appears a monster in relation to us? Yes. Is a flump actually a monster? No. It is a thinking, and at its core, according to the D and D rules, impossibly good creature. In fact, not only is it not a monster, but it's a better person than people are. I think it's a monster because it's so, I mean, it's so alien. Like, I think it can be intelligent and good and wise, but like the way it thinks and communicates can be portrayed as so completely different. It's a monster, not just because of the way it looks, but also because of the way it thinks. Even if you look at like biblical angels the theme is an angel shows up someone sees it they're terrified it's a monster and then it has to be like calm down calm down calm down calm down it's cool the first words every angel says is be not afraid because it's a fucking helix in the sky with wings and 17 eyes It's like that, except without any charisma. <laughs> right. It's not be not afraid. It's like, I'm a good <laughs> I am here for you. <laughs> Legitimately, what a flump amounts to is it's like if you took the middle ground between like sort of that like goofy little cartoon pet and also just straight up fucking angels. Angels deliver messages. That's kind of also what you want to use them for. You want to pounce this alien on them um, and terrify them and then like give them a lore dump on like the next area that they're going to go into. They basically feed on psychic energy. So they feed on thought and they're smart. So they, they, they must have a ton of like accidentally gleaned information. This has come up before, but the ecology of D&D is weird. While it's saying that like these are creatures that are terrified of evil and float around on the outskirts of Mind Flayer and uh, Aboleth communities, because their brain energy is the tastiest. It also says that they live in complex organized groups called cloisters and that they have like great intelligence, possessing advanced knowledge of religion, philosophy, mathematics, and countless other subjects. Like these, somehow, these are critters that, for all intents and purposes, should live in like huge towering cities. These are what people make elves out to be in most like fantasy writing, not necessarily RPGs. It should be flumps. It should be flumps. Absolutely. There should be a Fire, where just flumps rotate, collecting info. Building cities is something a person does. You're you're humanizing them too much. Uh, they they are they are aliens, and they live in strange alien like cities that aren't even recognizable as cities. This is fair, and I still hate it. <laughs> so we're gonna come back to my other major objection, which is just that like to what to the existence of flumps. Yes, to flumps as a whole. Okay, go ahead. As Alex mentioned, they are just messengers. 
the thing about an angel showing up is that even in D&D, it implies like a god. There is a will behind it. There is something like there is a reason it exists. Flumps are kind of treated almost like unicorns or trolls or whatever in that like they show up from under the bridge to give you the quest so that you could go do the quest. They've made them alien, but to a point where like there isn't a cause of flump. There's no reason for flumps to be there. There's no explanation of what that complex and organized cloister actually is. There's no talk about a flump family. There's no talk about how you make more flumps. There's no talk about where flumps come from. They just exist randomly as story drop-ins. I would like to think that when they collect enough ideas and thoughts that they can like deposit those ideas and thoughts into a brand new flump. Um, and everything that flump is, is whatever, whatever the previous flump had, had eaten. So they just have to collect enough thoughts, and when they have enough information that it's too much for their head, they make a new flump? Yeah. <laughs> God, I love that. I love that so much. I would really get on board with that, because this, this weird mystery sort of alien intelligence thing, having it be something that is entirely benign, has no interest in killing the players, but is actually just like a cell, where instead of taking in like glucose, it's taking in smart shit. Having it be a hyper-intelligent, unintelligent being is really, really interesting to me. But these are something that is marketed like it's a guy, but it looks fucked, and it lives in a place that it shouldn't live in. But also, it has a complex society that has been built up in a place surrounded by things that should basically immediately detect it and then murder it. If these creatures did exist in this world that we're talking about, in the D&D world, they would absolutely 100% have to isolate and protect themselves and maybe and and maybe it's it's not even about isolating maybe they don't care they just want to get the psychic energy but really don't like want to hang out and talk maybe it's too much for them to have a, a it could be very like emotionally impactful to have a conversation with a person maybe that's why they hang out near like mind flayers right because like nobody wants to go near those guys and mind flayers don't seem to mind them too much right they're like yeah okay you can you know just there's enough psychic energy around for you um, and maybe if you have like, like a large colony of flumps near a human settlement, um, like humans aren't, aren't especially psychic telepathic beings, right? There's like not enough food to go around. And if you do have that, that colony near a human settlement, like people just start kind of like, like forgetting things constantly. Cause like the, the flumps are eating too much. They, they hang around the mind players cause they can pick and choose. They can kind of wait for the good thoughts, right? Even the mind player will be like, oh, yummy. Um, so like they wait for that, those, <laughs> that, those good ideas. Oh, he's having a non-evil thought right now. Ooh, delicious. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you are a super good creature, maybe you don't want to feed off the thoughts of other good creatures. Maybe you do want to maybe eat a very bad thought once in a while. Like maybe it's your duty. But this is where we come into another sort of issue for me with flumps which is that they are a challenge of one-eighth. They have seven hit points. They have an attack that deals D4 plus two piercing damage plus one D4 acid. They are a joke of a combatant, and that's before we get to the ability they have prone deficiency. Yeah, which has actually been nerfed. That's actually been made easier than it has been in the past. If you flipped over a a flump in the past, they were basically dead. Like there's nothing they could do. I think they could roll, you could roll a very difficult roll to flip over once an hour. <laughs> so you were screwed. Prone deficiency is if the flump is knocked prone, roll a die. On an odd result, the flump lands upside down and is incapacitated. At the end of each of its turns, the flump can make a DC 10 dexterity saving throw, writing itself and ending the incapacitated condition if it succeeds. So you can take a flump more or less out of a fight for a while, because it's it's got a plus two dexterity, which means it's sitting at like a little better than even odds to get back up. Yeah, but also it's got seven hit points. So do you need to bother? Like, like no one's going to try and flip a flump prone unless you're purposely trying not to kill it. To knock somebody prone, it's a it's a strength contest. The flump needs to use its strength to stay upright. To the best of my knowledge, there is no baseline way to knock something prone aside from fighter maneuvers and abilities that say it knocks things prone. The way this is written emphasizes incompetence. 
Yeah. Like, it does not have enough hit points to survive a hit. It doesn't have the AC to avoid getting hit. And if it does get hit and it doesn't die, but also you could knock it prone, it might just basically fall over and die. Not from damage, but because it's upside down now. Which suggests they must have adapted. They are smart creatures. They are intelligent creatures. They are aware of magic and magical abilities. The fact that they don't cast spells makes no sense to me whatsoever, especially because in the past, the the reason it mentions that they are in cloisters is because there used to be two types of the species. There was a normal flump, which is basically what we have now. And there was basically a cleric flump. Like they were just born clerics. They looked different. They had different colorings. Their mouths were a little different and they were the, the priests of flumps. So they used to be able to cast spells and they should still be able to. There's no reason. Like there's the only thing you need to cast spells is the smarts to do it and maybe a pinch of dust or something once in a while. Not to mention that it's consistently consuming psionic energy, which, again, sort of like relates to eating thoughts. Like, if it lives near a Mind Flayer, it should eat being able to be a wizard. I should have sucked in Magic Missile by now, easily. But that's sort of the thing, is like, when I look at the Flump, it's not even necessarily its role in a story that bothers me. I get where it would fit in. But because they're so small and weak and lack any sort of ability or any reasonable way for it to have survived, like you you don't put it in. I would love for them to be mostly the same and then maybe just add something like they can force a spellcaster to unprepare a spell. Like they they forget magic missile. They're like, where did that go? When we talked about the unicorn, one of the things that came up was that it has a bunch of like lair effects and legendary actions that force it into a specific story context. It is a healer and a defender. This is a thing that is statted like a monster and you're told that you're gonna run into it near other monsters that should like destroy a party, just decimate it. If you're going specifically into the lair of a mind flayer and a flump comes out at you, you could sneeze and kill it. Like, a first level party would kill it in one or two hits, but it would take, like, an active choice. A ninth level party sees a flump, and there isn't a flump anymore. You have more than one flump, so they kill the first one. (laughs) Right. And then a whole pod of them just scatter in various directions like cockroaches. When I, when I first read the description, it talks about how they eagerly share their dark secrets they have learned in the hopes of casting down their evil sources of energy. Um, and, and even if doing so, they must seek a new, new sources of nourishment. When I first read that, I assumed that they had like, like they're living near a mind flayer. They get some bad thoughts, like um, I want to eat your brains or you know things that mind flayers think. And it kind of tastes bad in their, in their digestive brain. And then they see an adventurer and they're like, I bet you they're thinking about sunshine and rainbows right now. Like, I don't have room for these uh, evil thoughts. So I'm just going to vomit them out. I have something to show you. (laughs) 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 It is actually kind of fun if they vomit their thoughts just right into your face. And it does fit with their other abilities. Because, like, they do have telepathy, but at the same time, telepathy is treated as, like, mechanically, telepathy is treated as a language, basically. I think that telepathy does not use you're directly communicating feelings and ideas without the the middle point of translating into language more like mental imagery like kind of like the way that we think yeah, like just like putting the, the ideas directly into your brain if we were talking about like telepathy as you would narratively describe it yeah absolutely telepathy is something that bypasses language and then maybe your brain translates it into language or whatever the case may be but usually it's treated as a linguistic ability. If you have the ability to like create illusions or to just bestow memory onto someone, show them things like that, that's the sort of thing that would be treated as like an illusion ability as opposed to telepathy, where they just treat it as like it can talk, but it uses its brain mouth instead of its face mouth to do it. Right. It's like in Star Trek. They're all being translated by the universal translator, but you still see their lips pronounce English because it would be weird if their lips were just flapping away and they were saying whatever. That shouldn't sync up, but it does. 
and I would imagine that when this creature uses its abilities, its mouth syncs up even though it shouldn't. I'm just trying to find an example as I'm flipping through the monster manual as I speak. Of a better creature, you won't find it. Of a more noble and proud being. If I flipped one page in either direction, I find a better creature than a flump. There is one other significant source of flumps in any campaign, and that is wild magic. And then you have to insert them into anything that's going on. And they are the like more wild magic-y than almost any of the other options. The flumps being aberrations catches me off guard. Because before I did any research for this episode, the intuition is something like this is from Planescape. It's some sort of outsider. It's like a Modron, but for like good. It should have come through a portal. So like when it's wild magic and it's just a thing where a sorcerer did a thing and then somehow accidentally manifested the concept of good in the right way. And then this weird inept blob floats out and is like, hello, I want to be your friend. And then you scream and put an arrow into it. I like that so much better. I like the fact that good can just manifest in an absurd jellyfish that can talk. That is much better, Dylan. Everything that makes you human and not a flump is is the evil in you. Yes. Yes. Without that, without that burden, we'd all just be floating good jellyfishes with little massage tentacles that just want to relieve each other's tension. Imagine how terrifying a campaign would be where you had a wizard whose entire thing was turning people into flumps by removing the evil from them. Oh, I like that. Flumps would make for great horror because if they're floating around, the guy who tears your evil out and then your body basically goops and you turn into this jellyfish and all of the other jellyfish are just referring to him as daddy. Can it not be daddy? <laughs> can, it, can it be anything but daddy? <laughs> That reaction is exactly what we're going for, is all of this needs to be uncomfortable. The flumps need to be weird and unsettling in a way that people hate. I was so on board until you said daddy, and I'm, I can't. I can't with that. That's fair. Uh, what's up with the flumps telepathic shroud ability? Like, why, why is that there? Oh, you can't read my thoughts and you can't read my emotions. Meanwhile, I'm turning a whole different color that displays what I'm thinking. Right. And I can talk to you in your mind and I'll just tell you whatever I'm thinking because I want the best for you. <laughs> right. And despite the fact that I can block out my thoughts and my emotions, I'm vulnerable to psychic damage. It's a very weird combination. The other thing that's very strange to me is like it specifically calls out sense its emotions or read its thoughts. There's nothing there about actual detection. Telepathic Shroud would make a lot of sense to me in the context we were talking about earlier. They don't cast spells at all. So if this was a thing where its brain is shielded in a way that it's like it's consuming psionic energy, but it's like a psionic black hole. It, you cannot tell that it's there except by directly seeing it. That would make a lot of sense. That's an actual adaptation that makes their ecology make any form of sense. At all times, they should operate as like an ambulance of non-detection. Leave them, leave them open to scrying. I think if you're casting a divination spell where it's like, I want to find Teddy the Flump. Yeah, if you know Teddy the Flump's name, you should be able to find you him. Can, yeah. You can find him. But if you're just ambiently like wandering around, firing off detect thoughts and looking around for an aura, the flump doesn't exist. That little field that you're talking about should also be a permanent detect lies. They should be able to always know if someone is telling the truth or not, like a divination rod, just be able to instinctively know if someone is telling the truth or not. We'll find the truth. We've brought the flump. Yeah, it's a classic 5e thing where where uh, this is not finished, um, but we've we've started it for you and, and figure the rest out yourself. And that's the thing that annoys the hell out of me is I am very much on board for like a jumping off point to give me like an interesting little seed to start off with. But D&D &D leaves the stat blocks very, very well defined in a way that often isn't a jumping off point. It's a contradiction to the lore. It bogs you down. All of the interesting stuff we've said about flumps has come as a result of the lore, but it's been as a result of us sitting down going, these don't make sense. They're goofy little creatures. How do you make this make sense? 
but that's also good. That's also good because it, because it it forces you to reevaluate the world you're building, and it makes and then these monsters are then questions that you're asking about this world you're building. How do I fit in? How is there room for me? What makes me work? And it forces you to think differently about your work. But I do also ag agree that if we're going to do that work, then D and D should also have done that work at least once. It's not that I object to me having to do the work. It's that when I sit down and I read the lore and I'm like, these are a weird creature. What's the only way they make sense is like the psionic energy is actually feeding thoughts. It's not that they have a complex society that has developed science. It's they have a complex society that has consumed all philosophy of a given species. And then you look at its abilities and you're like, well, it doesn't seem to actually do any of that stuff. It has a whole headline where it says intelligent and wise and yet does nothing with either thing. Maybe people just think that they're intelligent and wise, but actually they're just trying to share their food with everybody. Flump's telling you fun facts is like a bird trying to vomit in your <laughs> mouth. They are intelligent, but but this goes back to what I said earlier, where where they're completely alien and like what they think is like a good use of their time might just be completely different. And then they can intelligently go about, you know, using their time in the way that they think is valuable. We judge accumulation of knowledge as being intelligent, but they may not. They just may judge it as being like well fed. Full. Right. Educated. Oh, I'm so educated. I couldn't think another thought. Would would a flump that just came into existence like be born with a bunch of ideas? Um, or does it have to collect those over its lifetime though? The flump society, wherever they're from, this if if so many of them vanish randomly and get sucked into this world. They're smart creatures who understand magic. They know what's happening, or at least have a theory. So when they get sucked in, they're, they're somewhat prepared for what's about to happen. So you've got a bunch of options. So the ideas of like a flump hive mind, and when the sorcerer summons one, he's pulling from an existing flump, which then knows all the shit the other flumps did. And when it actually manages to float back to the hive, the hive learns all of that stuff. That would also make a lot of sense as to why they like to hang around mine flares. Food becomes a non-vanishing resource. If we buy a steak and I eat the steak, it was my steak and I'm full and you guys suck. But if I go to the mine flares and I learn their plan and I come back and I tell you their plan, all three of us are full. Also, you make more food. By me telling you things, you make a lot more food. Yeah. Because you think more thoughts and then there's more food. That's a weird thing. If it wasn't psionic, which again, I don't think if you're not going to make psionics like a base part of the game, stop bringing them up so much in the base game. If you made it an information thing and flumps were capable of information synthesis, like I came to a flump and I gave it just the concept of addition and I gave another flump the concept of just the natural numbers and they came together and put together multiplication on their own and then they're more full. Like you could wind up with this weird thing where you have a circle of flump philosophers and it's actually just cooking. It has to go back to cooking with you every fucking time. Yes, they're all chefs, Dylan. It's a whole chef society. They do nothing but collect recipes. It's the recipe for spelling stuff. The Swedish chef is clearly a flump in disguise. <laughs> That's why he sounds that way. It's what he is. You're right. You're on to something. We normally don't go this rigorous, but for that third question that we always do, how do you improve flumps? First thing first, they only exist to interact with a relatively high-level party. Bring them up to par. They don't need to be as tough as a mind flayer, but they should be tough enough that a group of flumps could fend off a mind flayer and have someone survive. Yeah, they should have some natural abilities, plus they should be spellcasters. They should absolutely be spellcasters. They should that telepathic shroud should actually protect them from detection rather than just be a way to conceal information that is literally color coded on the body of the flump. I think the the forgetting uh, spell slots thing is perfect for that because like a mind flare can show up, assume it's going to cast a bunch of spells, and suddenly can't remember any any of its spells. So like flumps could have a natural protection against a specific type of enemy, but be useless physically. It basically becomes a type of counter spell. Counter spell, confusion. You could give it a bunch of spells, like wrong addition and everything, but you basically give it spell-like abilities. 
there's no good way to write and then it makes you forget a spell slot but if we say that it functions as a counter counter spell where it hears you casting a spell and then makes you forget the rest of the words to the spell fantastic alex you got any thoughts about the flump you feel like you didn't get out all of our thoughts were wrong and i think that's that's the best we're going to do you're a piece of shit no, he just covered his bases, man. So when everyone yells at us, he could be like, yep, see, I told him. <laughs> I, I said they shouldn't have. My name is Aram. Oh, fuck me. Welcome, Welcome to Murder All Generosity. Generosity. Don't threaten the audience. We have the majority of season one recorded and are already scheduling season two. We have big plans for the future of Kill Every Monster, but we need your help to get there. On Patreon, for $5 a month, you'll get access to ad-free episodes as they're edited, bonus content, and my DM notes. At $10 a month, you can also get print-ready maps and character sheets from each encounter for use at your gaming table. Check out all of our rewards at patreon.com slash killeverymonster. You'll also get bonus content and ad-free episodes for uninterrupted listening. Still not convinced? Check out a free preview of our Lorekeeper notes for the Banshee encounter at patreon.com slash killeverymonster. And we'll see you next time. Please don't. For murder every benefactor. Aram, just do whatever you're going to do. What do you mean? You know what I mean. I am your creative friend and partner, Dylan. I am here to support you. I'm not sure anything you've just said is true. How can I help support you? How can I help tell you tell a better story? How can I help you, Dylan? Just tell me about your stupid jellyfish. <laughs> My flump is named Flumphrey. Christ. This was voted on. This was voted on <laughs> by the people. I gave them options. Would you like to hear the other options? Okay, but if the other... I thought you would. God is dead. <laughs> Here are the four options. There was... Humphrey, which the fans decided should be flump free, which I agree with because the fans are always right. Number two was Flubushubu. Number three was Steven. And number four was Noodles, which I was actually sad about because I was really pulling for Noodles. So the name, as the fans have decided, Dylan, is flump free. Okay, tell me what flump free is up to. Flump free is busy tidying. Flump free is a very tidy flump. And their little, you know, fart jets basically blow air everywhere. So if there's dust, like it's really easy to clear up. They just kind of like shoot over the bookshelf and along the table and just scatter as they go. sounds about right i'm humming to myself my little tentacles are waving in the air i am a happy flump right now describe to me flump free's living situation flump free about 10 years ago found this series of tunnels these series of old lava tubes that seemingly people had forgotten about or it was just no one's bothered with and when he floated down inside them and began looking around like he felt himself pulled. There's a lot of psychic energy very deep below these caves. It's scary. It's powerful, but it feels very dangerous. So he's only gone so deep, but what he has explored has been very interesting. It's like these cathedrals. They, like there's a cathedral carved out of rock. There's living areas and where there was clearly a kitchen. They're all interconnected, all clearly formed from beings that would normally not live in these conditions. It's almost as if they were trying to live closer to whatever this energy is. And that pulled my attention. And there's also like a couple magical items, a couple of scattered religious artifacts. It just was a very interesting place to settle down and begin exploring. And since no one was here to bother me and plenty of psionic food, it worked out well. Is it just Flumfrey down here? Just Flumfrey. 
uh, and there's perhaps some assistance of some sort, and and just but mainly like it's just him. And again, he knows there's something larger and more powerful below him, and he's got enough courage to like maybe go like a few meters, you know, deeper with each ex with with each exploration. So there's definitely something else here, but he doesn't know what it is. Okay. In the last day or so, there's been how to describe this the food has been less uh, satisfying I suppose you can imagine feeding off of psionic energy it's something where you just exist in a field it's radiated off of the source it's like a soup everything that comes into that field gets included it's another ingredient you can tell something is wandering in the caves when the flavor changes, you know, there's an extra ingredient, but almost immediately after so that. So unsettling. I sensed your presence because the flavor changed. But the thing that really tips you off is not the flavor change. Something is wrong because the amount that you receive changes. It drops. The soup, for lack of a better word, concentrates. It is beaming towards that next ingredient. Imagine if you had a bowl of soup and then you put a potato in and then suddenly the soup just formed a fucking glob around the potato and abandoned everything else in the bowl. So if the soup became sentient and was interested in the potato. Like when it when it forms a glob around the potato, does it leave behind the carrots and stuff or are the carrots part of the blob? You're asking me to wildly overextend this metaphor, so as long as we're on the same page there, uh, the carrots and everything are like, it's more like there has to be a base spot, like it's radiating out from a given location. So there's a little chunk of beef in this stew, and that's where the soup really lives. It's from the beef. So brain soup aside, another presence has entered sort of your your territory maybe you don't think about it as a, maybe it's not like a closed border situation for you but they're in the space that you tend to operate within yes they're near me yes is that the sort of thing that flumphrey and again i hate this uh would go to investigate or is that just sort of no no flumps flumps don't survive because they investigate things that that is not absolutely not what happens flumphrey has been here for 10 years and he's gone about a hundred meters deeper right into the, yeah. like it goes on for a mile he's gonna be here for a very long time flumphrey doesn't investigate when flumphrey hears a strange noise flumphrey fortifies so flumphrey is going to put down his papers I love the idea of these little tendrils have been holding up just individual pages. <laughs> right. Yeah, a couple have pages. One has a magnifying a glass. One has chalk. Floats back into a corner of the room, a darkened corner of the room, and, like, concentrates to suppress their glow. Something like three hours after that. Flumpfree doesn't move. Sits in the corner for three hours. That's how flumps survive. Yeah. <laughs> They know what their strengths are, and it's that they don't have any. So, <laughs> nor defenses. <laughs> it's going to be a short episode, guys. If time passed and nothing happened, I think I would then turn to my friend, well, my assistant, and in flump. Your butler. My butler, yes, and be like, why don't you go check that out for me? Because that's the normal procedure. Like, if there's a noise and it repeats or I don't hear it get settled, I'm going to go ahead and send out the butler. Oryx, after a little bit more exploration, you've been down here for quite a while. It's hard to keep track of time because no one invented watches yet and also the sun isn't here. But you know it's been long enough to get tired. I want you to make me a perception check. Oh dear, so this is a three. This place echoes in every direction. Every step you take resonates. And like you think when you get into this territory, you can only describe it as like a complex. It stopped being tunnels. Like it was caves and then it was tunnels. And now it's definitely a place that someone carved out. And yet still every step you take resonates strangely. Is the butler relaying information back 
I can sense thoughts, but I can't sense thoughts that far. And to be fair, their thoughts are never very helpful. I mean, like, is it on, like, a scouting mission? I would say that the butler can be told very simple things. And the butler has been told this. Go, search, find, bring back. The butler finds a shape. It's a strange shape. It's it's like it's got four tentacles. Two of them are directly on the ground. It seems to be constantly groping the ground as it floats along. It resembles Flumfrey in absolutely no sense, except that it has eyes on it. But when you don't see any other uh, living organisms, you only have the one reference point, it's pretty much what you're working with. It looks like a bad Flumpf. What you would see, Alex, is when you look up this nine foot tall, four legged crab. So think like a, it, the body is similar to like a wolf with a long tail, but as a lizard, okay? And then the top part of it becomes humanoid form with giant claws and a mouth that's just filled with tentacles. It's worth noting uh, when he says claws, he means crab. Yes, I mean crab claws. Not like talons. No, giant pinchers, right? No eyes that you can see, just a smooth face that turns towards you as the head tilts. And then it just starts to, not quickly, but advance towards you with its claws open. Oh, well, I would like to kill that. Or get away. Maybe I, maybe I just want to run away from this thing. I, I'm guessing it's, it's moving towards me maybe faster than I can I can get around, particularly because I can't see very well down here. I think like running through the dark isn't necessarily going to be my, my first move. Um, I think I'm going to brace myself, um, kind of like get firm footing and then uh, summon uh, my imaginary friend's sword. The sword itself, uh, I believe to be my like a manifestation of my friend. I want you to tell me about the first time your imaginary friend lent you his sword. Oh, I was being bullied. Um, and like people are like, I kind of like, I'm a scrawny guy. And, and I was being like pushed around, unable to like stand up for myself. Like suddenly the sword just like appears in front of me, um, in between me and, and the bullies. And um, I, I, I pick up the sword and I point at them and that's enough to scare them away. And, and it's been with me ever since. It worked out really well that time and that people, they left you alone. It bought you space for years. Because of course, if you're, it doesn't even matter what age you are. You, if you're not an adult and someone pulls a sword on you, you run home and tell mom. And then they come to the random kin. They're like, where did you get a sword? Like, I don't have a sword. <laughs> that sword did not exist when they came to look for it. So you just became the crazy kid who pulled a sword. Yeah. But also no one could prove that it ever happened. So you you pull the sword. You, you just make that little like, there's not even magic words to it. It's just, hey, I need to borrow the thing. Okay. And you brace yourself. You get ready. Aram? The verbal component is hand me the sword. I need the sword. Yeah, here's the sword. <laughs> I look behind me and I, I, I say like, hey, can you, can you give me the sword? Right. Um, and then and then I, I kind of pull it out from behind me um, as if there was somebody standing there. You just basically reach into a void and then pull out a sword. There just happens to be something <laughs> yeah. near you where you can reach into and like your hand vanishes for a moment and comes back with but, a sword. Yeah, but for everybody else, it doesn't look like I'm reaching into like a portal. It kind of just looks like I'm I'm reaching out of sight. No one else can see it. You just happen to be turned the right way so that you're just the right angle for everyone viewing you. One person saw it once. <laughs> they cried. And three days later, when you asked about it, they didn't remember. Oh yeah, denial is a huge thing. So you hold this sword out and this beast is sort of like chittering and scrabbling towards you. Aram, how does the butler respond to a sword? It doesn't. The butler has one order, and that order is to scoop them up and take them to where I am. So it would just continue forward. Roll for initiative, folks. Oh, I rolled a 19. So 19 
plus two is 21. I rolled a 10. That's better than last time. <laughs> Working my way up. <laughs> As you mentioned, you're you're basically moving at like a purposeful walking speed, like just fast enough that even if it was a regular person walking towards you, it would be uncomfortable, but it's not a sprint. We spent time. I was like, okay, no, no, come across the room. Don't, no, slowly, don't be scary. Try to be welcoming, <laughs> right? Like we've worked on this. What do you want to do? The Chul, which is the creature you're facing down, has a multi-attack. It has a multi-attack that would normally cause damage. If it's successful, it can grapple. I would like it to do the multi-attack, however, choose not to inflict damage. It's simply trying to scoop him up and bring him back. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's start with the multi-attack. The first attack is going to be 14 plus 6 is 20. Does that hit you? That very much hits him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, 20 gets me. The second attack is going to be 15 plus 6 is 21. So what happens is this thing just glides into the room and wraps you up in its pinchers, lifts you off the ground with surprising ease. It is very strong. And then simply turns and begins to walk out. Uh, I think I would like to resist that. So you need to beat a 13 plus 4 is 17. Oh, well, I got a natural 20. That that would do it, yeah. 23 in total. This thing grabs you, it picks you up, and it turns towards the door and just starts walking out. You just have to get that little bit of leverage, you know, get the sword in, and you just plant it against this weird chitinous surface on the inside of the shell and just leverage. And once you get enough space in, you just kind of drop the three-ish feet kind of crouch down to get below it and get your footing like a couple f steps back. So am I essentially standing like underneath this thing now? It looms over you. Yeah, exactly. It's tall enough that like if it were another person, you would be a comfortable distance back. It's nine feet tall and has claws big enough that it could grapple two humans in each claw and hold them up. Right. It's also long like a horse would be. I would like to uh, stab it, and then like after I've, I've, I've skewered it with my sword, like knowing I can just get my sword back later, like my friend, my imaginary friend will go and, and pick that up for me and bring it later. Um, I'm just going to like skewer it and leave the sword there and then, and then run away. Fair enough. All right, give me an attack roll. So this is a natural one uh, plus three, so this is four. Is this the second natural one you've rolled in three rolls? Yeah, yeah. Surprisingly, that will not hit me. I miss drop the sword and, and turn around and, and run into the darkness as quickly as I can. Rom, strictly speaking, you got an attack of opportunity. Yep, I am going to make a grab of opportunity. And it's going to be a 19. I am crushing <laughs> it. And it's a 19 plus 6. So I need you to make a strike save as you turn to run and just get scooped up. And you need to beat an 18 plus four is 22. Okay, I rolled a nine plus three, 12. <laughs> yeah, you got me good this time. So this is this is full cartoonish. It's like you go to stab at this thing and as it swings, you just kind of ab abandon ship. You just drop the sword. It goes from a swing to a throw. The sword clanks off of its leg and just skitters along the ground and you turn to run and it grabs the back of your shirt like it's picking up a puppy by the scruff of its neck <laughs> and just lifts you into the air. The butler has possession of Oryx. Yeah, I, I think I'm yelling help. Like I'm, I'm yelling out to my friend, like I, I, I came so close. I, I, I came all the way here and you've led me directly to my death. Like, like help me now. The Chul's been trained to say a few common words. So as you're like yelling that out, the Chul keeps repeating, You are welcome to Like this horrific voice, but basically trying to welcome you to the tunnels. Your friend is quite frankly a bad friend. Like he, <laughs> he helps you, but at the same time, there are times where things have gone wrong and he's entertained. And there have been times where he's laughing and it's that sinister, that dark laugh of like, you've been led to your demise or you've been led 
into temptation and darkness. This isn't that. The voice thinks this is fucking funny. <laughs> Unable to breathe. I just like go into fetal position in the, the claw of this monster. The chul would very gently cup one of the claws under you to support you. In, in a nice little egg. <laughs> yeah. So after a, a couple minutes, like, of winding through the tunnels, the voice gets a little quieter. You, you can still hear him. Your friend still speaks. But it's almost... The only word you can put to it is suppress. And you walk into a room. It, well, you don't. You, it, the, the butler walks into a room. You're carried into a room in a fetal position between two tremendous crab claws. <laughs> rows upon rows of pews leading up to a speaking space there are uh sort of metal plates embedded in the walls just in a way that would catch light and reflect it almost like a spotlight onto that front altar and floating way out in front of you is like if stewie griffin's head just had tentacles dangling off of it the most awful creature that has ever been conceived. I'm flashing through all my colors. My tentacles are flowing out. I am as large and imposing as I possibly can be. Just a rainbow strobe light <laughs> sparkling <laughs> off of those <laughs> metal plates. Arx, you observe ahead of you, Flumfree. Would I, I? I just see this thing as it is, basically. Like, I wouldn't recognize this in any way. Yeah. So, I scream. <laughs> and then as soon as you do, I would also scream. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then in your mind, oh, you startled me. My, my friend, uh, so infrequent that I get visitors. It's so wonderful that you're here, that that you've come to join me. You're speaking into my head at this point. It's telepathy. Which you also have. Uh, so this is pretty strange because I've only ever heard one voice in my head before, but this is a different voice. And I'm a, I'm pretty confused and I, I, I stop for a moment and I, and I think about it and I, I examine you. Snuggles, is that you? My head would turn like a dog's when they're like, what? And my color would settle on like a deep green. And I would just float from around the pillar and my little tentacles would like reach out and I would just kind of gently slap the chul until it puts you down. <laughs> there, there, okay, enough, enough, uh, there, okay, go. Why, no, my name is not Snuggles. My name is Flupfree. Alex, I'm gonna have you make an arcana check real quick. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Oh, okay. Well, that's a 16. So this is partially your knowledge and like reading, just generally trying to get a handle on what was going on with you. You've come across a lot of esoteric knowledge, as well as the voice at the back of your head, which, like I said, got quieter. It's suppressed. But at the same time, you hear it as if from across the room. There's a fucking slump down here. <laughs> What's a, a, a what? Oh, and glides over and there's like a like a bench next to you, right? And gently wraps a couple of tentacles around you, guides you over to the bench, pulls out a book with one tentacle that has an entry on flumps and hands it to you while it props your feet up on a nearby table. You recognize this. You've actually read this exact passage before. This is a pretty common uh, reference manual for like exploration into the Underdark and creatures that make their homes down there. Uh, it was written by this uh, this explorer. Uh, generally, uh, God, how to describe his reputation? Jackass. No one likes him, and he's a lying asshole. His name's Volo. <laughs> you're looking through this. And you're like, there is no way in. Oh no! It it must be. The first time you saw it, you didn't believe it was real, and now you are faced with the unequivocal truth. No, no, somehow evolution let this fucking happen. 
I go back again, and 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 I even though I've I've heard both voices in my head in this room now, but um, still trying to like figure it out, and, and and I ask, do you know who I am? Of course, I know who you are. You you are a visitor. You are you are a new friend. How did I not find that thing yet? How did it get one of my jewels? This time, speaking to the other voice. And, and I say, is this is this it? Is, is this what you're trying to show me? Are you speaking telepathically or are you just speaking out loud, Alex? I think I'm, I'm speaking telepathically, but I think I think Flumps I can hear this stuff. I can't read minds. Yeah, you can like direct telepathy. So it's really just sort of a question of, are you good at telepathy and you're speaking to your patron or are you just like brain screaming? I think I've never had to do anything other than brain scream. Like I've never been around multiple telepathic yeah. people before. And so I've always just brain screamed and uh, whoever was listening could pick it up. Uh, what do I do? I don't know. Kill it. I don't care. Ask it what it eats. Uh, what, what do you eat, Flump Free? Well, eat is a strange term. I, I exist. In an ether of thoughts and ideas, I am nourished by your brilliance, by your love, by your memories. I take just a little bit, just just a sip here and there. Oh, just oh, just a little taste. Which? And I share with you. Oh no. I don't like that. I hear another. I don't like that at all. No, no, that's not acceptable. I hear another. Oh, oh, you have so many ideas. They're, oh, they're so interesting. I think you've picked something up. You've learned something from before that the Aboleth does not want you to know. Yeah. What is it? This Aboleth is a very old Aboleth. This whole complex, this whole structure existed in worship to it. And it was at one point very, very powerful to the point where people had to come and stop it. And that created a cataclysm that buried the Aboleth and its entire group of worshippers under an avalanche. That has now been uncovered a bit, and the flump has taken residence. The Aboleth is still alive. It still lives down there, but it's wounded. It's vulnerable. So what he knows is that there's a way to go kill it. And that's what it doesn't want anyone to know. There's a way to get to it and end it. The voice, Alex, at the back of your head just tells you Ask it if it knows about the knights. This time out loud, using my, my, my mouth. Do you know about the the knights? Oh, there were many knights, many of them, all over these claimers. They came in from everywhere to believe and to worship the great one below. Many nights, many days, many eons, survived the entire time. <laughs> Lots of that. The voice kind of comes back and just goes, You're going to need to talk to that telepathically because if you get it to respond out loud again, I am. I swear I will take full possession of your body and I will handle this myself. Fabulously, fabulously, for eon, for eons. Make it stop. Uh, so so, I, so I, I reach out with my mind in, in another brain scream. <laughs> I said, I can't understand a word you're saying. Oh, 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 oh. I am so sorry. Uh, my mouth is not made to form the words that you use, human. You don't need this thing. What it knows is what it learned from me. Let me tell you a little secret, human. What I know, I learned from another. Do you know which way the other is? glides in real close, gets its fleshy, 
jellyfish face like right next to yours and its tentacles just kind of gently scoop your chin and turn your ear. <laughs> I, I'm pulling back as much as I can, but like the tentacles are on the other side. <laughs> it's just pulling you towards it with equal amounts and just getting nearer and nearer. There's the third party, which is that voice at the back of your head, and you can just feel that reticence. Like, it's mildly uncomfortable with what's happening, not because of the physical discomfort. It's like, it's not sure that it wants you to hear what the flump is going to say. Yeah. And then our fourth party, which is as you're trying to back away from the flump, the butler just extends a claw up against your, just flat against your back to stop you from backing up anymore. I know many things, my friend. The old one's heart is calcified. It's lying. It's in a, a jaw almost. It, it's like a gem. It's quiet. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful pulsing gem. Stop it. Now I could reach out and show you to not let it where you could touch it. I'm feeling overwhelmed and I just I, I want to get out of the this like claustrophobic situation. I'm like backing towards the, the entrance of the, the cathedral. You're not leaving yet. It knows too much. I wouldn't be worried about you hearing these things. I trust you. We've been together so long. But if it tells anyone else, it'll come for me. And anyone that comes for me wants you as well. Oh, the tea's on. It goes floating off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I feel like really uncertain and, and with kind of like a, a shaky voice like a shaky mental, like stuttering in my mind. Um, I say, uh, tell me how to kill it. Anything, literally anything. <laughs> Sneeze at it, throw a small rock, it's dead. <laughs> you could probably trip it. I know it floats, but trust me, you can actually trip it. Are you making tea in the same room or did you like fly up to another cavern or something? No, there's like, there's like a little side, like a cloister where there'd be like a tiny kitchen off to the sides. Like you can literally see him kind of banging on pots and dropping things. The chul is off in a corner. It has walked in a circle three times and then kind of sat down. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is cast mage armor on myself. And then I'm going to uh, be like, oh, can I have that sword back? And, and kind of like reach behind me, um, grab the sword and, and, and pull it out. It hits your hand with force. It's not like, normally it's got that sort of squire effect, like someone's holding the blade with two hands and just holding the handle out for you to take. This was slapped into your hand with momentum. This was not, here you go. This was fucking take it. I don't know if I can sneak in this scenario or like approach the flump in a way that does not attract the chul's attention. The chul isn't that clever. If the chul is running on like instruction, I'm not sure that it would. I'm not sure it would either. If we're both uncertain, then we're going with no. So I'm going to, I would like to sneak up on the, uh, on, on, on flump free. I have like laid out, like there are 18 different tiny cakes. I am a professional baker of little <laughs> tiny cakes and I've arranged them on a four shelf tier. And in the center of this tier is a little coffee pot that like just sits on a hinge. So you just put your cup in front of it and just swing it on a hinge and it stays inside the little dessert tree. And I'm just very carefully arranging that. And then I'll stop for a moment and I'll second guess something and I'll move a couple of the desserts around. I'm not even gonna make you roll for stealth. Yeah. This thing is so Reasonable. entranced that just, <laughs> it doesn't notice. Unless you I think make I've also, noise. I'm also so overwhelmed by the situation and I've been like trying to accomplish this goal for so long of just like find the voice that I have like tunnel vision and I, I can barely even see all the cakes and teas and, and things like that. And it's just the flump. And I, I, I get up behind him and I, uh, <laughs> I say, um, I'm sorry, flump free. And then I, I, I stab the sword um, into- Give me an attack roll <laughs> against the flump. Oh no. Oh. 
Uh, oh, it's not a one. It's a it's a, a seven plus six in total. So this is a thirteen. That does hit me. <laughs> that just hits me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Six damage. Okay. I'm not dead. How does this happen? I'm just like, oh, no, 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 no. And then <laughs> just through my chest. It's a stab trying to go center of mass, but because you have so many tentacles, it's like yeah. a just a deep gash along the bottom of your sort of football shape. The whole top part of me is able to turn around, though, even though my body stays where it is because it's impaled. The whole top part of me turns around and these two eye stalks are like, eh, two, you know, like my friend like there's a real even though it's a very alien thing you can see a real pained look of <laughs> betrayal <laughs> and then it's going to nail you with stench spray <laughs> so that wound that you created it, it just explodes out from it this acidic blast of stench and acid uh, you need to, <laughs> you need to succeed a DC 10 dex save or be coated in a foul-smelling liquid. Yes. He's also going to cry out for the butler. He rolled natural two. Alex, you roll for shit. <laughs> Plus one. What did I say? Remember when you said I was being mean? I was being right. <laughs> you were being right. Alex is a terrible die roller. He needs like a pinch roller. So I rolled a three. I rolled a three. Right in the face. Just full on in the face. <laughs> Like being three feet from a skunk. Now let me tell you what Aram has mechanically accomplished. Uh, must succeed a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or be coated in a foul smelling liquid. A coated creature exudes a horrible strength stench for 1d4 hours. Aram, you can roll that. Four. You are, it is like in your eyes. It is soaked deep in every crevice. And you are poisoned as long as the stench lasts, and other creatures are poisoned while within five feet of you. <laughs> a poisoned creature has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. That's a good time for that. So disadvantage on everything but saves. So that is your action, uh, Flumfree. Yep, and then I call out for the butler. You can hear the skittering in the next room as that thing just leaps to its feet and starts coming forward. Goddamn terrible. The voice in your head just screams, do not let it escape. I was going to say that, like, after I stabbed Plum 3, like, that's when I saw the cakes and regretted the decision. But I think I, I just got sprayed with, with stink acid in my eyes and everything. I can't see anything at, from, uh, I can't see these cakes and teas. There's no regret <laughs> happening. This is when it cements my belief that, like, yes, this is some kind of horrible dungeon monster. It sprays acid on you. I can hear the the big thing coming up behind me. I know that's that's more of a threat. I pull the sword out of uh, Flumfrey with like more acid spilling all over me, um, and and I turn around and try to get a a, a view on on the butler, um, the big guy. You can see it pretty clearly. Like this is you were in the next room over. So the moment it started moving, you just had to look back through the doorway and you can see it coming. Then I ask the voice in my head, and, and I again say, save me this time. This is, I'm gonna cast Mind Spike. Fantastic, tell me what Mind Spike does. So I reach into the mind of one creature you can see within range. The target must make a wisdom saving throw, taking 3d8 psychic damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. On a failed save, you also know the target's location um, until the spell ends, um, but only while the two of you are on the same plane of existence. While you have this knowledge, the target uh, can't be hidden from you um, and gains no benefit uh, from that condition against you. So I'm going to like know where it is all the time um, and then also just do some damage as I as I link on to that. Rom, give me that uh, save roll. Seven. Yeah, no, uh, Alex, you get your, uh, your 3d8 psychic. It's actually more than that because uh, I'm casting it with a, a third level spell slot because Warlocks only get the, the highest. So 48. 12, 18, and uh, 24. Yeah, you take a little chunk of your consciousness and you sharpen it into a barb. 
and you just let it fly from the center of your head into this thing and it stabs through you watch it reel and you just push a little bit on the far end that spike goes through its head and then bends 90 degrees and just lodges itself in space you can feel it you have this thing's mind just in the palm of your hand I can't really do anything else. I don't really have any bonus actions to use. Uh, I can move around, but I think I don't want to do that right now. You have him exactly where you need him. Please, my friend, I I have no desire to, to do this. And I pull out this wand. This strange metallic brass wand with all these little branches off it, these straight little brass knobs that end in globes, little glowing glass multicolored spheres. And as I point this at you, they all throb and pulse. Please, my friend, we, we are not enemies. I do not want to hurt you. If he takes a move against me, I blast him with this wand of wonder that I discovered deep in the catacombs of this old temple. So I'm, I'm blinded by acid. So as you're like talking to me at the back of my head and, and this, my, my imaginary friend who's been with me for my whole life um, is, is, is telling me to- Just finish it. Um, I've got my, my sword pointed towards uh, the tool, um, but I can hear your voice behind me and I, 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 I do swing around um, in like, in like a, a baseball bat swing. Flumfrey's tentacle grips tighter, and the glass bulbs begin to blink on and off as light races up and down the wand. He shifts to a deep, mournful blue. His face is heavy and sad. I am so sorry I failed you, my friend. And he closes his eyes, and the lights stop on a rust orange bulb. It flares brightly and fills the room with light that becomes... <laughs> wings. A cloud of 600 oversized butterflies fills a 30-foot radius centered on the target. <laughs> the area becomes heavily obscured. The butterflies remain for 10 <laughs> minutes. So take that. Alex, do you want to make your attack roll at disadvantage? Uh, so that was a, uh, actually a 16. Oh, to hit me? Yeah. Oh, that hits. Oh, no. All right, roll your damage. Uh, 10. You hear the sound of a inflated balloon being let go and a light sort of tinny clatter as that wand drops to the ground. And that was like at the end of this a sword and I glow this deep violet as I just kind of slide and the sword sinks deeper into me and I'm just sliding towards him and I'm able, I'm able to reach one tentacle out and just gently caress the side of his face and in your head you hear the words the darkness has you but its heart is here and it shows you a very clear vision of where the Abolus heart lies in these chambers before it slumps to the floor. If you want to suggest creatures for future episodes or talk about the monsters we've discussed on the show, head on over to our Discord. You can find links on killeverymonster.com. And we'll see you next time for Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster. Oh, <laughs>